How is everyone today? Stephen made it. Good. So I'm going to take you on a journey into the science of water, how water moves in our body, and um, why water is so important. We already know water is important, but now you're going to find out why it's super important, and especially the water that you put in your body. So um, unfortunately, the water that we drink is aging us, and I'm going to explain why. And uh, the older you get, the worse it is, unfortunately. So um, in school, we were led to believe that water, 75% of our bodies, it's incorrect. By molecular weight, we are 98.73% water. So we're pretty much water beings, the aquatic ape, some call us. And so not all water is the same. Now, when we drink a liter of water, a normal liter of water, this is one liter, is 20,000 drops. 20,000 drops of H2O. Now, in those 20,000 drops of H2O, are six drops of what is not H2O. It's six drops of HOD or HDO. And uh, if you see hydrogen, first element created in the universe, and the simplest element is the uh, simplest element because it only has a proton and an electron, except for its isotope or version of hydrogen known as deuterium. Now, deuterium has a neutron still considered hydrogen. Now, 99.98% of all hydrogen in the universe is in this simple configuration that we know as protium. But in 1932, it was discovered that we have other versions of hydrogen. And this isotope of hydrogen, of which there's very little in the universe, is double the mass of its parent, or, it's the, or, or the original protium version of hydrogen. This was discovered in 1932. And so, there are actually three versions of hydrogen, but we don't talk about tritium, because that's not really important for this conversation, at least. So the unfortunate thing about deuterium is that it also binds with oxygen to create water. So oxygen is kind of stupid. It doesn't, can't distinguish between deuterium and hydrogen. So it also picks a high deuterium to bind with itself to create what is known as heavy water, or semi-heavy water. And so one out of every 3,300 water molecules is in this configuration. So when you look at a bottle of a liter of water, six drops usually is not H2O. It's HDO, OK? So which is this configuration right here. And occurs one out of every 3,300 water molecules. And this one, which is heavy water, both deuteriums are replaced by the hydrogen occurs one out, of every, one out of every 41 million. So there's not a lot of it. But we do use it for, uh, we synthesize it for all kinds of things, atomic energy, atomic nuclear, nuclear bombs, uh, medicine, et cetera. So um, some facts to consider. Okay, We recycle about 1,900 gallons of water in our bodies per day. That's the metabolic water that runs our bodies. Now, we only. Uh, um, that only accounts for about 20% or 25% of our daily water requirement because we lose a lot of water daily, so we have to keep consuming water. But the water that our bodies make, the metabolic water, is not the water that our bodies that we drink. So you have to consider that none of the water that you drink actually makes it into those nano-confined spaces where energy is produced in your body. It's a radical concept. So in a lifetime, 75 years, let's say, 52, millions, 52 million gallons of metabolic water is recycled. That's incredible. And in this water that keeps getting recycled, we have between one and four grams of deuterium. This doesn't seem like very much. Um, however, when you look at the millimolar ratios of deuterium to the basic necessities of life, glucose, potassium, magnesium, cal et cetera, you see that there is three to five times more of this deuterium than the basic necessities of life. So it is a problem, actually. And um, I'm going to explain why. 
real quick, where did this all come from? What is the origin of this? I like origin stories, and I think it's really important that we know where things come from. And this comes from the relationships that was forged 1.45 billion years ago when the eukaryotic cell said, hey, I need some help here. So it made a deal, a, synerg a synergistic relationship, probably the, o the oldest marriage in the universe, of the nuclear DNA, the nucleus of the cell, with the mitochondria, which thermoregulates the body, which produces ATP energy. So it struck up a deal. Nucleus said, hey, I'll give you food. Mitochondria said, I'll give you energy. Congratulations. We have a long-standing relationship inside the cell. And um, inside the cell, there's a process called the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. Probably heard of it, read about it. Now, at the end of this cycle is where the bulk of the ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency of our biology, or at least the energy currency of what thermoregulates our bodies, produces the most amount of ATP at the end of this transport chain, and that is inside the mitochondria, um, inside the, let me get back here. So inside this Krebs cycle, it goes into the electron transport chain at the very last piece of that chain is the ATP synthase nanomotor, which I will talk about now. Now, this is what a mitochondria essentially looks like. There's about 320,000 of them per cell, so they're, they're really active, keeping you alive and breathing. And here is that ATP synthase nanomotor. This is really important because this is a nanomotor that we can't see with a naked eye. We need a microscope. And when you look at it, it turns out it's the most perfect motor in nature. Thank goodness, because this is what runs life on Earth. And the reason is because it shuttles 9,000 protons per minute, spins at 9,000 RPM. It's a motor generator. And it produces ATP and metabolic water. And it does this at 100% efficiency. And this is what makes it such a unique thing, because we can't make a motor that, that has 100% efficiency, at least not that I know of. So here they are chugging along working nonstop every day, uh, 500 protons per second, going through this little guy. And this right here, these are protons, OK? And these protons, can't see it. These protons, these little, hmm, oh well, can't see. Anyway, those little protons, those are derived from what? What produces the energy? Well, the breakdown of food eventually breaks down to the point where you have nothing but that proton and electron, and that proton causes this motor to spin. And um, that's how you produce or recycle energy in the body. This is all floating in water, by the way, right? This is all happening underwater. And so ATP becomes ADP, gets used for energy. ADP becomes ATP again. And this is a perpetual, ongoing cycle. And um, but problems arise, then, well, I'll talk about that in a second. If you, have, if, you have, if you have problems, then obviously you lose energy. And eventually, you lose the integrity of that cell. Eventually, you lose that cell. And then this is the physical outward sign of aging, right? The loss of energy and the uh, physical perception of aging that we see in people. So Dr. Olgun in 2007 discovered he discovered the exact mechanism of how this ATP synthase nanomotor is compromised, how it's damaged. And it ha it's a purely mechanical problem. Because instead of a single proton coming in, you have this deuteron, which is a neutron-proton pair. And the motor's not made for this. Even billion year of evolution did not prepare it for this. So this little bad guy right here causes the motor to stutter and jam, basically it causes it to break down over time. And so what we know uh, as life, this concept of utopia, it's really a grind, because this is a motor that's physically doing the work to produce the energy in our bodies. And it's also a drag, because when you have deuterium, it slows down the rotation of the motor. In fact, no ATP is produced when a deuteron enters. Now, how often does a deuteron enter the motor? Every five seconds. Based on just about everybody, this is just almost ubiquitous because of, the, because of the water and the food that we eat is higher in deuterium now than it was before. So this is a 
slide from Dr. Olgun's pivotal paper in 2007. I, I think he's going to win a Nobel Prize for this eventually when people catch on to how important this is. Now, for those of us that don't understand all this mumbo jumbo, just know that it grinds your gears. This is what deuterium is doing to us. It's grinding our gears and there's no lube. So these are the gears that it grinds. This is the ATP synthase nanomotor. It's only made for that proton. It, it's, you can't put a square peg in a round hole. So uh, this is what's happening, essentially, when a deuteron enters an ATP synthase nanomotor. Now, by causing this motor to stutter continually, every five seconds, you know, it's like you get the right thing constantly, and then you get the wrong thing, right? If you wake up in the morning, and your significant other kisses you every morning, and one day you wake up, and you get an elbow to the face. And it's constant. It's coming around again and again and again. You just don't know when. <laughs> so. It destroys this ATP synthase nanomotor, and eventually, when it's destroyed, now, when it's destroyed, everything stops, but, but the actual mechanism of its destruction is it's, it's like a shear and a grind, right? So uh, it causes it to stutter. Now, when you have this stuttering in this motor, which is held by a membrane, what does that do to the membrane? It weakens it, and eventually causes, what, leakage. And when you have proton leakage, that's it. Eventually, the motor stops, no energy is produced, those jobs are shipped off overseas, and the factory is gone, and it'll never come back. So once again, here you have a ATP synthase nanomotor, the top part of it, OK? And it wants protons, but when it gets something twice the mass, it just doesn't know where to put it. So it creates damage. And that, da that damage has to constantly be repaired by enzymes that come in to repair this damage, but eventually that damage cannot be repaired. Okay, so when I graduated high school, it was 1990, and that uh, this pivotal paper, at least pivotal, pivotal, pivotal in this field, in this science, which pertains to all of us, impacts all of us, it was published that um, deuterium simply does not behave the same way as protium. Now, this was known 50 years earlier, but now and again, People have aha moments and go, wow, this is really significant. And so the problem is, is that because it's heavier, it's slower. And this is known as the kinetic isotope effect, and I'm going to talk about this real quickly. So here's a quick illustration of what happens when that motor stutters. Eventually, it breaks the membrane. And when you have proton leakage, the amount of protons on one side equal the amount of protons on the other. Therefore, there's nothing that can shuttle to, from one side to the other. So it just gets, there's just no energy to be made. There's nothing to move it. It's like when salt water mixes with fresh water, what do you get? You'll never get fresh water again. Another illustration, just so you walk away here with some visual memories of what we're dealing with here. This is the problem. This one occurs very, it's very rare. Uh, but this is the problem, OK? And it's more and more of a problem because our planet keeps getting more deuterium in our water supply. Uh, more than it, we have more now than we had 100,000 years ago. We have more now because of the foods that we eat. Because, because nature's strategy is to load the carbs with deuterium and deplete the fats. And we're <laughs> eating way too many carbs as a, as a, uh, a society, as a culture, as a species. And um, this increases our deuterium load. Now, it's a very simple equation. If I take, if I take this bottle of water, which has 94% of the deuterium removed, and I put it on a scale next to a regular bottle of water, you'll see that this one weighs uh, 300 milligrams less because deuterium is heavier. It's twice the weight. And even though it's not much, it actually shows up on a scale. So we know that this neutron's the bad guy. We know that. Everything in our biology is trying to get it out. Remember I said none of the water that we drink none of, doesn't make it into the water inside our cells. Into the, in the, the, the water inside the mitochondria, known as metabolic water, is water that's made fresh. It's synthesized de novo through this process of production of energy, of ATP. The byproduct is metabolic water. All water that we put in, the body keeps that out of these really sacred spaces where energy is made, and it only uses the water that it makes itself. Why? Because it's pure. 
It's pure. It's H2O. There's no deuterium in it. There's no other contaminants in it. There's nothing. And that allows it to have a very crystalline structure. When everything is pure and ordered, there's coherence. And if you introduce something into that, it breaks that coherence. Deuterium breaks that coherence. So it's the elephant in the china shop. Uh, unfortunately, some people don't like to see the elephant. And that's where we are today. And that's why I'm here, to tell you about this problem, but also offer you a solution. So in the early 90s, it was discovered by uh, this gentleman, probably one of the oldest researchers in this field, Dr. Shimlai. Uh, he wrote a couple books on it. This is his latest books. It was discovered that the ratio of hydrogen or protium, the protium being the abundant form of hydrogen, the ratio, so the ratio of regular hydrogen to deuterium turns in the body, turns oncogenes on and off. What does that tell us? That tells us that if the more deuterium you have, the more risk you have of getting cancer, of mutations. Okay, And this is a Trojan horse. Why is it a Trojan horse? Again, because oxygen doesn't have a centralized, central organized nervous system. It can't tell the difference between deuterium and hydrogen. But enzymes and other processes in the body do make that difference, and they exchange hydrogen for deuterium. And this is where this new science, this new field of biochemistry known as deuteronomics come from. It, it endeavors to explain how deuterium is managed in the body, and it also shows how water moves in the body, because this is all about how water moves in our bodies. So once again, you have the compatible hydrogen, and you have the incompatible hydrogen. You see the difference in mass, OK? And now we're going to get into, we're talking about the molecular structure of water, and, and uh, now we're going to get into um, more of the quantum aspect of this, OK? Because you need to understand the problem fully. So now we understand it damages mitochondria because of the ATP synthase nanomotor, mechanical problem. We know that. What else does it do? Well, quantum mechanics. Well, let's define quantum first, OK? Because it inter interferes with quantum mechanics or biology. What does that mean? It seem, I think everybody has a different definition for quantum. Uh, because every, everybody, everybody I ask, <laughs> nobody has the same answer. But I'll give you my definition of what quantum is, and I think it's the right answer. Uh, most people think of, when they think of quantum mechanics, they think, they think of this. And uh, this is <laughs> this is <laughs> very nice illustration, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean much to people that don't understand quantum physics. So what quantum essentially means is that a particle can be in two places at once. OK? And this is exactly what hydrogen does. Hydrogen quantum tunnels. This is what's known as quantum tunneling. And we don't know how it does this. What's <laughs> incredibly important here is that no life would exist in our known universe if it wasn't for this process, which violates the law of classical physics violates the law of thermodynamics because it shows up here. Now, in classical physics, if you, you've got this energy, you've got this hill, right? This energy, um, this, this uh, um, resistance that something has to go over, right? So, okay, so this is classical physics. But hydrogen just shows up on the other side as if by magic. Why? Because if it had to go over the hill, like I said, no life would be possible. We have to cheat. We have to break the law of physics for life to exist. And that's quantum tunneling. So hydrogen show, shows up on this side of the mountain and goes poop, and then shows up on the other. And we don't know how, because it just did this by magic. And it, it's too fast for us, to, for us to stop it and ask why. So um, you see that P there for proton? So essentially, it's like uh, teleportation. It start here and then like, uh, show up on the other side. And we need this, because, because we, need, we need this to, to create life in this universe. So this is a very neat trick that uh, violates all known laws of physics. It's happening nonstop. I mean, our bodies produce the 20 million cells per second, OK? So this is, everything is happening very, very quick, very fast faster than we can perceive. So you can see here um, the quantum tunneling of hydrogen versus deuterium. Now, hydrogen is the only element that 
quantum tunnels, as being the first in the periodic table, everything is too big after that. So the subatomic particles quantum tunnel quite easily. Protium quantum tunnels quite easily. But deuterium still quantum tunnels, but just not as much. So it slows everything down. And this is known as the kinetic isotope effect. And the kinetic isotope effect tells us that the carbon-deuterium disassociation is nine times slower. So if you have a carbon-hydrogen bond versus a carbon-deuterium bonds bond, you have a dissociation that is nine times slower. So it's like the uh, it's like the fad kid, you know, keep up, right? But they can't can't keep up. So it slows everything down, and this violates the integrity and the coherence of life, unfortunately. Actually, slows it down. Right? So the time, from the time we're born to the time we die, we just keep accumulating deuterium. And it, and it wreaks havoc on our bodies slowly. It's like watching the hour hand of a clock move. You don't see it, but when you turn your head and turn it back, you go, whoa, it moved. So this is what's happening. It's ongoing and constant damage. So uh, another illustration of the kinetic isotope effect. This one disassociates nine times slower than this one. You can imagine what kind of problems that creates in our biology. So you have, so in water, you have this shorter bond, right? You have the, normally it would be H2O, so you'd have a symmetry on this other side, but you don't. You have this, you have this shorter bond, and uh, if you love something, set it free. <laughs> but unfortunately, this won't. So this, this is the reason why it's, the disassociation is not the same as hydrogen. It's, a, it's heavier, it's a tighter bond, so it's slower to release, okay? And this, this is the state that we want to be in. We want our cells to be in a high vibrational energy state. But when you add deuterium, you get a low vibrational energy state. And I, I liken this to having a brand new pair of shoes, having trained for a marathon for a year, running five to 10 miles a day. And then as you come out the gate, you step in a whole bunch of gum. And that's what deuterium is. It's an external force on us that is slowing us down. Unfortunately, it's all around us and in us. So the goal is to reduce it. Now, mutation, as we know, leads to DNA errors. DNA errors leads to cancer. Simple, simple graph. And sure enough, as we age, we have more DNA errors, more mutation, more incidence of cancer. And deuterium actually causes one of the main reasons why DNA doesn't replicate properly. And you can imagine that if you have Three billion base pairs of DNA, which means that you have one deuterium atom per 300 base pairs. Now, DNA, it's, I mean, it's all hydrogen, right? Everything's, everything's got hydrogen in it, right? <laughs> every every uh, nucleic acid, ribonucleic acid, everything has a hydrogen on it. Now, imagine if, if it was more than one deuterium atom per 300 base pairs, two, five, 10. This causes an error in transcription because one, it distorts the shape of the DNA because it's just simply heavier, and that causes improper replication and mutation. So everything from the DNA up, DNA itself included, is a coil, is a spiral. Collagen is the same way. It's a coil within a coil, a spiral within a spiral, and this is really how our uh, proteins are packed. It's how everything is organized in the body. It's how everything is able to be packed in to such a small space uh, because it's, a, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a fractal puzzle, right? Uh, like if you unravel it, you'll see that you can, all of, your, all of your veins and blood vessels could stretch around the earth more, probably more than once. But it's all packed in, right? And it's all packed in tightly and it all has this spiral configuration. Now, the integrity of this type of coil sacred geometry spiral configuration uh, is held in place through symmetry, okay? And this is called chirality. It's when, it's when you have uh, molecules, cells, enzymes essentially, proteins, that are mirrors of one another. Now, if you have this hydrogen replaced by a deuteron, then they're not going to be perfectly identical, will they? There will be, you will lose that symmetry, you will lose that mirror reflection. And the analogy I like to use is that if you're flying a plane and one wing is heavier than the other, they look exactly the same. But when you get up in the air, you notice one wing is heavier than the other. It's going to be a lot harder to fly that plane. In fact, you'll probably nose dive and crash. And this is what's happening when our cells replicate. 
So a great example is collagen. So the cross-linking of collagen is what gives us that smooth integrity in our skin. And as we age, that's lost. And deuterium has a big part to play in this. So it's a difference, it's a difference between whether your skin looks like 5,000 thread count Egyptian cotton or a potato bag. And this is what happens as we age. And it's because of this spiral within a spiral, a coil within a coil, and the integrity that it maintains as it, un, as it, as it uh, uh, goes from nano to micro to macro. So interesting study showed that using deuterium-depleted water actually increased the collagen layer and the cross-linking of collagen, which is phenomenal because it means better skin. And um, in fact, it, when you drink deuterium food of water, you reduce the deuterium in your body. That reduction of deuterium or being deuterium depleted actually does uh, manifest as better looking skin. And this study shows that. So quick timeline, because this is less than 100 years since we've even discovered that deuterium, had, that deuterium existed, that hydrogen had other versions of itself or isotopes. So this was discovered in 31. In 2007, Dr. Ogun wrote that pivotal paper. And then shortly after that, the science of deuteronomics started. It's a branch of biophysics and biochemistry now. And people are starting to take notice at the academic level. But it's a slow, it's a slow process. So six drops of heavy water. Now you know why the six drops is really important, why it's not just insignificant as some people believe. What's six drops? Big deal. Well, now you know that it's a big deal. Okay? And if you, if, if you take that to the extreme, say one liter of water has six drops, normal water, but what if you, in a lab, make heavy water, pure heavy water, or even 30% heavy water? You'll die on the fifth day. That's what happened when they when they discovered deuterium, they made heavy water and said, is this, is this the same as water? Because it looks like water. It tastes like water. To, to a, unless, you have a, unless you're a scientist with a, uh, with a very sensitive scale, you can't tell if it's water or not water. Okay? But it's not water because it'll kill you. It's, the, it's water that looks like water, but it's water that'll kill you. And if you have just a little bit of it, it'll just cause you to age. It, and it, the more of it you have, it'll increase the problems, health problems, increase the level of aging. And the less of it you have, the more energy you have, and the slower is the aging process, is decelerated. So before that, um, another, another uh, these scientists are working in like, uh, in like uh, uh, in a vacuum, essentially, because they don't read each other's publications between what happened in Russia, here, there. Here's another one. This was, this was from the 70s, where the conclusion was that deuterium is incompatible with biology. And then it was just you know, put on a shelf and forgot about. So when I found out about this, I did extensive research to find out, look, do we have, do we have 60, 70 years of material on this? And we actually, we do. So now the Russians looked at it a different way um, versus the Americans. The Americans who discovered deuterium, they wanted to see what it did. And they found it was incompatible with life because they made this heavy water in a lab. And then they gave it to mammals and they died. So they said, OK, this is bad. We don't want anything to do with it. And the Russians said, well, what happens on the other extreme? What happens if you give people water that has less deuterium in it or less than the average that's on the planet? And Here's, a, here's something I found that showed a census from the 1800s and, uh, and later uh, in places that has, I'll talk about places that have less deuterium and why they have less deuterium in their water. But he showed that there were some people who had reached the age of 160 years, almost 1,800 centenarians. Uh, and this is in an area in the mountains. And in the mountains, you always have water that has less deuterium. And a re there's a reason for that. Uh, which I'll explain in a minute. Just see how we're doing on time here. Okay. So what happened was there was these populations in Siberia, 
and they were trying to understand why these people were so healthy and why they lived so long when they shouldn't because they pretty much live in Eskimo-like conditions. Okay? It's, it's like mo minus 60 nine months out of the year. And so a young biophysicist and, biophysicist and a young gerontologist decided to try to figure this out, and they did. They studied everything, their food, their lifestyle, their everything, and then they honed in on the water. This was in the 50s, and um, it's very interesting because it wasn't that long ago. It was 15 years before that the deuterium was even discovered. So these guys were going out on a limb, said, let's look at their water. And they looked at the water, and they analyzed the deuterium, and they saw that it had 16%, their water that they were drinking had 16% less deuterium that existed pretty much everywhere else, or most cities on the planet. And this is what started this whole research off, and then, and then they not only studied the people, they also studied what happens to plants, other, other animals, other humans, when you reduce the deuterium in their water over time. And sure enough, they got the same conclusion, which is when you reduce deuterium, you increase the energy in the body, you increase lifespan, you increase the time, it, you, you, you decrease the time it takes for, for maturity, for a, an animal to get to a virile mature state where it can reproduce. So you just enhance everything in the experience of life when you reduce deuterium and the opposite when you add it. So uh, 1960, they concluded their research. In 1961, it was published in a Russian journal. In 1966, it was published in a, uh, a Nature, an American journal. And so um, we were well on our way to, to understanding this aspect of water. And then six years later, really got into the biochemistry of it and how it does its damage. Because they didn't know why these people were living longer. They, and they found out it's deuterium or the lack of it, or the reduction of it, because all water is going to have deuterium. It's just a little bit less is much better. So they didn't know the biology behind it. They just knew that this was the reason. So on the planet, most of our water is, our drinking, most of the drinking water is 150 parts per million. The ocean is 155.76, to be exact. And, uh, here in Austin, it's probably about 150 or 151, the, the water that comes out, of the, comes out of the tap. In certain places in the world, you have these anomalies where you have less deuterium. And that usually occurs at the poles. Uh, in fact, Antarctica has the lowest deuterium on the planet in their water, 89 parts per million, which is water that's locked in time from millions of years ago, tens of millions of years ago. It's, it's a reflect, it's a, it shows you what the amount of deuterium was on this planet was at that time, 10, 10 to 20 million years ago. And then you have these interesting places like the Himalayas. The Himalayas has an uh, anomaly there that causes its water to be about 20% lower in deuterium than the average. So it's about in the 120 range, or approximately 126, which is incredible because this is what our biology wants. Our biology is made for somewhere in the 120 ppm range, because that's how we evolved as Homo sapiens sapiens 100 to 200,000 years ago. So uh, unfortunately, very few people get to have naturally available deuterium depleted water because it occurs so rarely and in such hard to, uh, hard to reach places. These are the people, by the way, the Altaians and Yakutians that were studied for their longevity and discovered that it was because the water was 16% lower in deuterium, but not only the water, because that affected everything. That affected their food and everything they eat. So their bodies were naturally lower in deuterium. And over time, this is a, this is a cumulative benefit over many lifetimes. They, had, they showed an incredible response to it in terms of health span and lifespan. So, six decades, six plus decades of research has shown us that we start out in life as a hydrogen fuel dragster, and we end life with a proverbial bovine hauling our carcass across the finish line of life. Why? Because we lose energy. Aging is about energy. When you're older, you have less mitochondria than when you're younger. Why do you have less mitochondria? Well, deuterium is one of the main reasons. So, 
Okay, so there is quite a bit of research on this. And uh, I put it all up on this website I created called deuteriumdepletion.org. 60 plus years of research in every language if you're interested in further study on this subject. Now, according to Wikipedia, though, it means nothing. So we, <laughs> we are censored on Wikipedia. Uh, it, 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 it's a, it, it violates their, uh, their standard of care. Right? They have one standard of care, and they like it, and they, it's an inconvenient fact or an inconvenient truth that uh, deuterium, and I think we're, you know, I think we're censored on Wikipedia because of this cancer thing, where Dr. Shimlai discovered that the hydrogen deuterium ratio turns oncogenes on and off, the genes that make you, uh, that give you higher risk of cancer or lower risk of cancer. I think this is why they've completely taken. In fact, we've gone in. Actually, other scientists have gone in, not myself, and changed this, like put in all the studies. Everything, all the, all the, uh, all the review, all the, there's a, some peer review stuff out there, not much, but they, but they listed it all, and the every time, the next day, it's gone. Okay? Only Harriet Hall telling us that uh, it's not worth it because water water's 20 bucks a liter, and it doesn't do anything, and, uh, and I don't see any good science-based evidence that make me fear deuterium. Well, she died this year from the jab, so, you know, take your truth with you, right? Oh yeah, now, now what do we do? Now that we know the bad news, what do we do? Because <laughs> this is pretty bad news. But here comes the good news. A keto diet is, a, is the, the reason keto diet works is because it's a deuterium depleting diet. Like I said, nature's strategy is to deplete the fats. Good fats have a deuterium level between 120 to 135 ppm, and carbs are way over 150. So, and it's better to eat fats anyway, because look, you produce more energy from one ketone body versus, versus one glucose molecule. Wow, like more than three times the energy. So the conservation of energy is just superb. Eat more fat. In fact, for every, for every essentially, Kilo of fat burned, you get a liter of DDW. Because remember I said our bodies make our own water? That's the metabolic water. So when the body burns fat, when you fast, you have to, like, I love dry fasting. That means no food and no water. I love that feeling of being empty. And I love the feeling of observing my body making its own water. How does it do this? Well, it combusts hydrogen and oxygen and puts them together and makes H2O. And so where does it get that hydrogen? It gets it from the fat. And that fat is deuterium depleted. So go keto. Now, the easier way is to drink the water that we produce. This is called light water. And again, we called it light water because, in fact, it is lighter. There's less deuterium in it, less of the heavies. So, so um, unfortunately, this water is very difficult to make. It's nearly impossible to make. Because when we think of filtering water, taking contaminants out of water. First it was distillation, and then about 50 years ago, reverse osmosis came onto the seed. And this strips the water, basically strips everything out of the water. But in this case, you're removing water from water, because you're removing HDO from H2O. And they're so similar that it's nearly impossible. And in order to do it, you need an enormous amount of energy. And this is what makes the water expensive. And so the goal of drinking light water is to reduce your deuterium. Drinking one bottle is not going to do it. Drinking two bottles is not going to do it. This is something that happens over time. It's cumulative. This is something you do for, from three months to the rest of your life, or either continuously or periodically. But when you drink deuterium-depleted water, when you exchange fluids, when you lose some and then you drink some, you will essentially reduce deuterium at a level of half a part per million to one part per million per day. So it takes time. It takes 45 to 90 days. And then you want to maintain it. And you'll want to maintain it because you'll notice it. You'll notice an incredible reserve of energy coming up. And um, my deuterium level is about 100 ppm. So anywhere between 
uh, that, or I, like I said, ideally, based on the science, 120 to 130 is the ideal in the human body. That's basically where the body can say, okay, I can manage this deuterium, I can, I can select for it and reduce it, keep it out of the electron transport chain, not 100%, but almost, because that metabolic water that our bodies make is already deuterium depleted. It's 60 to 70% deuterium depleted. So there's a clue right there of what our bodies want for energy production. So you can dilute light water or you could drink it straight. The point is that the water you consume has less deuterium in it than the water that is leaving, okay? And that lowers your deuterium level. And uh, essentially, you can take a liter and stretch it four times, you can go, and that gives you, a, like we make a 10 part per million, and if you combine that with four parts of regular water, you get 122 parts per million. So anywhere between 80, which is one to one, and one to four is pretty, is pretty ideal. Or you can just drink it straight and then keep doing whatever else you're doing and you'll still, it won't be a nice linear depletion, but you'll still get there. You'll still reduce the, the deuterium in your body. So uh, this is our factory right now. Uh, it's, like I said, it's, <laughs> it's very difficult to do. You have to recreate the hydrological cycle of nature in, in, a, in a column, because essentially what we're doing is there's a, we're exploiting the difference in temperature, slight difference in temperature, about a half a degree of difference between in the boiling and the freezing point at the phase change of the difference between H2O and HDO, and that's how we're able to pull it off. And it takes an enormous, like I said, amount of energy, and this is what makes the water expensive. Now, we're getting ready to build a factory here in the United States, uh, but this, was, this took about uh, 12 years to create by my uh, partners and colleagues. We also started a testing lab because it's good to know if you're drinking expensive water, trying to reduce your deuterium, it's good, to, it's good to know if it's actually doing anything, if it's working for you. So we bought a very expensive instrument, tuned it for saliva, and so we can test your deuterium levels, test your saliva or breath vapor, or essentially any liquid, and you could see that something is actually happening. So this uh, article right here, uh, this uh, study, um, by Dr. Borosh and his colleagues, uh, pretty much shows you, it pretty much explains that the ideal range in the body, as I've been saying, is, in the, is 120, or the 120 to 130 ppm range. So this is, what, this is what our biology is optimized for. And in fact, like I said, when we evolved, we had less deuterium on the planet. So now we have more. So if you wanna be optimal, you'll get to that, you'll get to that level in your body that was created in the first place. Cool, I'm getting close, two minutes. Okay, we already looked at this slide. Um, so, remember I said about the Himalayas, how it's really neat and interesting because it has less deuterium in their water, about 126 parts per million. So, not everybody can go up to the summit of Mount Everest uh, without oxygen. In fact, most people cannot. You'll die of hypoxia. You have to have supplemental oxygen because there's just not enough oxygen up there. But Sherpas can do it. Sherpas not only can go to the summit of Mount Everest uh, without oxygen, they can go up there carrying your bags. And how do they do it? Because they're deuterium depleted. After 30 days of deuterium depletion, as the studies show, what I'm gonna say to you right now is incredibly radical, and I really want you to take it in. After 30 days of deuterium depletion, your body can utilize oxygen, can Utilize oxygen at twice, twice the efficiency that it does at 150 ppm. Therefore, these people have a deuterium level in the 120 ppm range or less, depending on their diet, or more, depending on their diet. But they're able to exist in these hypoxic type of environments without the need for supplemental oxygen because their body is optimized. When you reduce deuterium, you increase the ability of your cells to carry and use oxygen and so you can go to Mount Everest without oxygen or supplemental oxygen because you're deuterium depleted. And uh, this tells us, this study tells us why the Himalayas are deuterium depleted. There was a meteor that crashed there. 
So a long time ago, and this water got into the hydrological cycle, that meteor had a lot of uh, deuterium depleted water on it. Anyway, we're, we're getting it low on time, so I'm going to speed it up a little bit. This is my favorite study. Again, this is the one that shows that after a month of on deuterium depleted water, the, the efficiency of your ability to, to use oxygen, your ability to uh, uh, your uh, ability, your basically your cardiovascular ability, uh, go like basically just doubles. Okay, just doubles. Pretty much shows the same thing. Control group, light water group. It's just it's it's incredible. So, here are the benefits of deuterium depletion. Now. The benefits of the water is only deuterium depletion. The water has, does not do any healing. It doesn't do anything except deuterium. Is, this water only reduces deuterium in your body. These benefits are the benefits of deuterium depletion. Optimized energy levels, greatly improved metabolism, greatly improved cognitive function. It's across the board, which includes health span and lifespan. And especially reaction time, because the best, best way to test your mitochondria, I think, is to test your reaction time. And um, if you have a quick reaction time, it means you're, it means you're youthful. So we want to avoid the slings and arrows of getting over here, right? Let's just deal with <laughs> staying right here our entire lives and not deteriorate. Because as we get older, this gets faster. If you're 90, your chances of getting to 100 are 1 in 70. If you're 100, your chances of getting to 110 are 1 in 700. It's a snowball effect as you get older. So let's stay right here. And we could do that by keeping our deuterium low or lower. About 16 to 20% lower is the ideal. So take the quantum leap. Find out more about deuterium depleted water, about our company, Light Water. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. I think we have a, a minute or two for any questions. Anyone have any questions? So what's the difference between the structured water and then the reverse osmosis and then the light water? Light water simply has less deuterium. That's it. That's the only difference. Now, in our, in our water, it's also incredibly pure. So we don't, this is probably the purest water not probably, actually it is. This is the purest water on the planet by virtue of what it is. It's pure water, it's pure H2O. Everything else has been removed, nothing has been added back. When you talk about structured water, what you're talking about is crystalline water. Like in our, in our metabolic water, it's, you know, ice is like a crystal, right? It is a crystal. And what makes it a crystal? Because everything is coherent and perfectly structured, right? It's, it's, it's packed so densely and tightly that it can't be anything but perfectly structured, right? It has perfect geometry, and anything, anything interrupting that will skew that away from that, from that crystalline structure. So metabolic water is that crystalline water, but not in ice form. So structured water essentially is, just, means, it just, means, it just means water that has a higher order, more crystalline type structure, which is what our bodies use. Does that answer your question? Reverse osmosis is just a way of cleaning water from contaminants, but it does not remove deuterium because it does not remove that molecule, that HDO or D2O molecule cannot be removed through a membrane process. But it takes everything else out. Basically, anything that's not water is removed through the, through the process of uh, reverse osmosis membrane technology. Uh. I first heard the uh, the term metabolic water in the context of dry fasting, which you mentioned. Um, and I mean, I've, I've even heard like uh, like your body extracting metabolic water. That's how you can go several days even without water, without becoming dehydrated. Um, but like, like as far as dry fasting, f would that be like a uh, like a fast track to deuterium depletion, or like what? It, it seems like yes, what, but you'll start yes because well, it's fast but slow at the same time because it's, one, when you stop fasting and you start eating or drinking normal water, your deuterium levels will go back up. Now, when you're dry fasting, yes, the water that you're producing in your body is deuterium depleted because it's coming off of your fat. That hydrogen coming off of the, coming off of the, coming off of the, uh, the, 
the fat chain, the lipid chain, right? Carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So that hydrogen comes off, and your body creates its own water. And that would also expel the deuterium quicker. It's, you're only going to you're only going to expel half a ppm to one ppm. Now, if you're if you're sweating, you know, like sauna, it, it'll it'll the process will be faster. It's just that all the water that we you know we lose x amount of water per day, and we have to replace it. So when you re, if you replace that water with water that has less deuterium, then water with deuterium will leave. The water, the body the body does have a preference. It does select for protium over deuterium. Why? Because deuterium, is, it, it slows it down. It's heavier. So you're always going to take the lighter thing. You want the path of least resistance, right? So uh, the body does select in the cellular processes, but it just gets overrun too fast. Just gets, from the time we're born, we have too much deuterium. So it just overrun. And uh, this, this leads to problems. And when you, when you, when you're reduced in deuterium, like I'm just going to use myself as an example because I've been on this for two and a half years, drinking deuterium with Peter water. You see the benefit. I mean, metabolically, it's just incredible. The be metabolic energy I have, my ability, my ability to, uh, my ability to um, basically burn calories. It's just my metabolism is, is like I am a teenager again. It's just absolutely incredible. And this 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 affects everything downstream: your sleep, your cognitive process, your mood, the lightness of being, everything. Great. Thank you, Victor. Round of applause for Victor. <laughs>